and this basically draws from a working paper I wrote while I was at Kasi. I'll you know uh, try and draw a synoptic picture of what the Indian economy has been you know uh, under this government, and things were pretty bad even before the pandemic struck. Uh, uh, we can go into a lot of more interesting questions which Dipanchu had sent to me while you know, he was sending me the invite in the discussion. And you know, uh, before I get into the presentation, you know uh, uh, what Dipanchu was saying, you know about uh, uh, the global backlash we are saying against globalization. Uh, I think it's a very, it's a very interesting example to draw. And personally, and this is just to provoke people into a discussion. Personally, I do not think India fits into that category because I don't think we ever globalized enough to trigger a backlash from globalization per se. With that provocative note, let me start my presentation. Uh, you can see the presentation, right? Dipanjo? Yes, yes, we can. Uh, yeah. All right. Let me try and take out my earphones. Am I am I am I audible clearly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are perfect. All right. So uh, I will try and wrap it up at time. So 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 basically, I mean, this paper which I've written it tries to because the the Indian economic situation has been so bad that you know every two quarters you need to update that things have gotten from bad to worse. And you know the, the basic motivation, you know, and by the time I reached Kasi, I mean we were having a pandemic. So there was no question that the economy was going to grow. A contraction was on the scene, though the, the first quarter GDP numbers have proved that. But I still thought that there was merit in trying to draw a larger political economy picture. So because so in a democracy, it is politics which shapes policy, it is policy which shapes economic performance to a very large extent, no matter how small the size of government has become in our country. So you know, as you see the title itself, you know, it, it tries to link, uh, you know, the situation before the pandemic started, the situation we are in right now, and what kind of future does the economy have? So, you know, the basic question to ask is, you know, this is, you know, uh, so the government has been claiming, especially after the GDP numbers have come out, that the economy is in the process of having a V-shaped recovery. Now, when people say there's a V-shaped recovery, they refer to the English alphabet so, so called V. Now, the red line here is the absolute GDP, you know, every quarter since June 1997. And you can see the you know, absolute GDP pretty much always grows. And these small flips are seasonal fluctuations. And this is where we have come. You know, if you look at the last thing, the June 9 to 20 quarter, so this is how sharp the fall has been because 25% so of our GDP has been taken away by the pandemic. Now, anybody who says that we're going to have a V-shaped recovery is basically saying that, you know, probably, you know, by December quarter, our GDP will be back to these levels. That is not going to happen. I mean, the, the contraction is so sharp that it is very difficult to happen. If you look at the GDP growth rate, you know, it's gone very low. So, uh, apart from the government, nobody expects this to happen. You know, the, the RBI does not expect this to happen. Every credible macroeconomics, whether it is, you know, uh, whether they are teaching in a university, whether they work with private sector, whether they work in India, whether they work abroad, nobody expects that the Indian economy will even overcome its contraction phase until you know, the December quarter. So this growth rate is expected to be negative for at least a couple of more quarters. But it is not the case that India's economic problem started with the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, if you see the red dotted line I have in the, uh, in the chart, we were pretty much in a pre-falling phase you know, even before the pandemic started. India's GDP fell very sharply from 2017-18 to 2019-20. In the March quarter, the last quarter before the pandemic, our GDP growth was 3.1%. That was not because of the pandemic. That was because of a systemic slowdown the economy was caught in. So, will we have a V-shaped recovery? What is our economic future going forward from now, at least in the medium term? I mean, it is very difficult to talk in the long term in a country like India. Uh, I think the answer to this question has to be found in political economy and not just economic literature. Uh, you know, my basic points are that you know, the main uh, cause of our problem is the economy has not been able to find a stable growth anchor after the 2008 shock of the global financial crisis. Whatever little bit of recovery we had was driven by you know, favorable exogenous development which have dissipated. This regime's political performance and this is you know, uh, why I am very glad that Nilanjan is here. You know, it 
it is increasingly all of us are coming to the conclusion that it is completely decoupled from its economic performance so whether it recovers the economy or it doesn't recover the economy it will not face political implications for it and this is exactly why i do not you know think that even the shock of this pandemic is going to change india's political economy significantly i mean there are hopes things could happen but as of now you know, and we have also seen the opposition's response do not forget you know from april may june july last five months we have seen what the political opposition in this country has been up to so the broad framework is we'll have it in three sections we'll look at the pre pandemic economic situation this you know tries to sort of give a you know background to our discussion how did the government react to it and what could have been done so until a couple of years ago you know everybody used to claim that india was the fastest growing economy in the world so how did we you know go from the fastest growing economy to the fastest growing economy i mean if you look at this these be the world bank numbers even the, the major economies in united states china emerging market world no country has had as sharp a growth slowdown as india had and mind you these are pre pandemic numbers what was the government's response you know if you are interested you can you know, go and read you know this in my casi paper but this is you know part of us goal speech which it delivered you know on 1st february 2019 the indian economy was in a very sharp slowdown phase by then and his speech reflected his exuberance he was celebrating macroeconomic stability he was celebrating his government's growth performance so the sum and substance is the government was in denial mode and this was not some political speech at an election rally this was you know, the government's budget speech which is the government of india's biggest annual economic exercise so what explains this slowdown you no know, because you know, india is a major economy this, you know, a lot of people have been dealing you know dealing with this question so i, I think you know, among the most comprehensive takes on the issue which came was from arvind subramanian and josh felman arvind had been the chief economic advisor to this government until a couple of years ago in december 2019 they wrote a paper where arvind uh, arvind subramanian built on his earlier you know, argument which he had you know, given in an economic survey and he said the current slowdown in the indian economy is because the twin balance sheet problem has mutated into a four balance sheet problem and you know this is a chart from arvind's paper this is the substance of his argument that he says that you know by 2019 20 in the first half of the year commercial credit had just collapsed so you had no situation so what was the twin balance sheet problem for those of you who do not know in before the 2008 crisis hit there was a lot of exuberance you know among entrepreneurs even those who would not export and they thought that the boom was going to last forever so when the boom got disrupted then what happened was that they were sent you know, developed with bad loans banks could not get back their payments this the industrialists could not pay their loans so there was neither supply of loans to be lent to other people there was not any appetite for loans that was a twin balance sheet problem this problem the four balance sheet problem arvind subramanian argued was because of the crisis spreading to the non banking financial sector so if this was the, the slowdown was a result of the four balance sheet problem what should have been done to resolve it arvin argued that fiscal policy will has not helped because because he argued now now you economic student so you know that you know, fiscal stimulus is one of the most mainstream conventional economic response to a, a growth slowdown so he cited the fiscal deficit numbers and it is a fact that the government has been window dressing fiscal deficit numbers he said that because fiscal deficit has been going up any day and growth has not revived so fiscal deficit would not help he said because the monetary transmission mechanism is broken because banks are growing risk averse and they are not lending despite reduction in interest rates even monetary policy was not being able to help he and so felman argue that financial sector reforms are the only way you build a bad bank you put in some capital in you know in banks do this one time resolution then do governance reforms etc so that you know these kind of situations do not develop in the future that is the solution which arvind and josh felman offer the problem with such a solution is it is a necessary condition i mean any modern capitalist economy if they have to you know, grow they have to fix their financial sector financial sector is the bedrock of economic growth in any modern capitalist economy but it is not a sufficient condition for growth revival in india why you know even if you do all that you know the critique of the growth the kind of growth we had before the economic crisis hit in 2008 is that there was a lot of bad lending now that growth has had its side effects and you no know, it bad it hangover later but let us not forget that during that period it actually did create you know a period of high growth and this is something exactly what the modi government was trying to do before the 2019 elections i recently interviewed professor viral acharya you know viral acharya and urjit patel both of them have recently come out with their books 
and the crux of their critique is the government tried to dilute the same IBC process which it itself had brought into play. So they wanted to do reckless lending in order to sustain growth before the election. Now, if you do financial sector reforms and you take this mechanism away, where does demand come from? Because you no know, demand is not going to fall from thin air. I mean, until 2008, we used to have an export side stimulus. Where does demand come from now? And that is exactly you know, the counter view to the Arvind Subramanian kind of an argument. And this is a paper which was published in the, in the Economic and Political Weekly uh, uh, you know, earlier this year. And this paper by Ziko Das Gupta, he, it argues that financial fragility, which is what Arvind sees as the cause of you know, poor growth performance, is actually an intrinsic component of the kind of you know, economic trajectory India has entered. Because there is no exogenous driver to growth. And you know, after the 2008 crisis, exports have not performed, government uh, 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 has an FRBM act in place which sort of you know, uh, prevents a counter cyclical economic policy intervention, etc. So he says that this you know, financial fragility is basically systemic to India's you know, uh, capitalist development today. And you know, these are the numbers which he cites to support his argument. And these charts show the ratio of non financial firms, which are basically, you know, uh, your industry services, etc., where the interest coverage ratio was less than one. So these firms were not earning profits to even uh, you know, pay their interest rate. And there's been a gradual rise and this was very sharp in the December 19 quarter, the last period for which these figures are available. I would encourage you to go and read this paper to sort of do this argument. But there's one argument which Zico's paper does not uh, 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 explain. You know, when Arvind says that you know, the fiscal deficit has been rising and growth has not revived, why did this happen? So, when these, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, headline numbers can be misleading. So, you know, if you just look at the fiscal deficit numbers and then deduce that, you know, because fiscal deficit has been rising and growth has not revolved, revived, therefore a fiscal stimulus has not helped, that might not give us the true picture. This is a chart which shows us you know, central government's total expenditure and central government's gross tax revenues as a percentage of budget estimates. Now, if you see this chart, you'd see that the rise in fiscal deficit has not been because the government has been spending a lot of money in the economy. <coughs> in fact, government expenditure as a percentage of even what the government promised in the last budget has not been happening. Fiscal deficit has been rising very sharply because tax projections have fallen flat. You know, if you, uh, in 2019-20, India's tax buoyancy actually turned negative. So when tax buoyancy turns negative, it basically means that even though your GDP grows, your taxes go down. Now, because the government's taxes have been performing very badly, and this you know, by and large starts from the you know, period after demonetization. And you know, remember, demonetization, GST, these are reforms which were expected to bring more taxes. What has happened in reality is they brought less and less taxes. Last year's performance was particularly bad because in September 2019, the government announced a massive corporate tax, corporation tax you know, cut to quote unquote boost growth. The growth was never boosted, but taxes fell very badly. So, Government, the point I'm trying to make is that the government's rising fiscal deficit has actually not led to a fiscal stimulus to the economy. It is just the case that government is collecting less and less taxes and its deficit, even without a fiscal stimulus to the economy, increases every time. Uh, let us come to the lockdown now. Did you know, the lockdown help? You know, India was you know, among the few countries which announced the very draconian lockdown. It was announced at four hours of notice. You know, we all have seen images of migrant workers suffering. You know, utmost pain, etc. Did the lockdown help? I think, uh, you know, uh, if the, te the test of the lockdown is, did it stop India's infections? Clearly, it did not help. We are now at more than, you know, 80,000 daily cases per day. We have crossed the 4 million mark. And, you know, as of now, nothing looks like, you know, India will not, you know, uh, eventually become the worst affected country from COVID-19. Fatality, to be sure, there are arguments, but at least number of cases did not stop. What has been the impact of the lockdown? Now, this is a chart. I think, you know, it, it is always uh, good to talk about headline GDP numbers. But this is a chart where I've done a simple thing. I've taken the June quarter sector-wise DBA contraction. So, mind you, the higher you are, the higher the contraction is. It does not show growth. It is contraction. And I've taken the employment share of each sector. Now, if you see here, you know, sectors such as trade, hotel, transport, and communication, uh, construction, manufacturing, etc., the most employment intensive sectors in the economy suffered the biggest uh, contraction in growth rate. So, you know, the lockdown, of course, it has you know, uh, given a uh, 
blow to headline numbers what it has done is the most employment intensive sectors have suffered the most what has this led to this has led to a sharp fall in incomes this has led to a sharp fall in jobs even jobs which have remained their people are you know being forced to work you know on lower payment salaries formal sector informal sector everywhere consumer confidence has completely collapsed these are numbers until the end of july i mean there's absolutely no reason that there would have been a very sharp recovery in august so there is no way the economy is going to have a v shaped recovery what did the government do the government did promise that they were going to announce the 20 lakh crore rupees 20 lakh crore economic package 10% of you know, india's gdp what was the actual fiscal component of that package the actual fiscal component of the of that package was just around 1% most of that package is basically in forms of credit guarantee the rbi injecting liquidity etc those are important measures at least the credit guarantee measures have you know, prevented funds from you know, going belly up because you know, they didn't go bankrupt otherwise but even the government's own survey now you know, the, the last uh, August they conducted a survey where they found that 75% of India's medium, micro, small, and medium enterprises. You know they have 30% of the GDP. They provide at least 25% of our employment. Three fourths of them were working at less than you know half their capacity. So the government's package has not helped. So even you know private economies such as Pranjal Bandari, everybody was surprised. Everybody was expecting the government to do more in terms of a fiscal stimulus. earlier the chief economic advisor was telling us that there are no free lunches in the world now we are being told that at an opportune time we will do that so so by the time we have had probably a couple of more quarters of contraction so we don't know uh state finances are in an even worse shape you know all of you must have followed the uh the controversy around gst payment so around 2.35 lakh crore the center is saying they cannot pay to the centers the, the, to the state they will have to borrow you know if they borrow the entire amount they will have to pay the interest rates also and other central taxes will also suffer and you know this is a situation which has been turning bad from earlier itself this chart shows that even in earlier periods the center has not been so how it works is the center promises a certain money to the state out of its central taxes and that you no know, center has increasingly been you know uh, 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 not fulfilling those commitments in 2019 20 according to the latest available numbers the situation was the worst in you know a decade and let us remember that it is state governments which do most of the heavy lifting as far as fighting the pandemic is concerned as far as a lot of salaries are concerned as far as a lot of development expenditure is concerned so if state finances are in a bad shape then it means that going forward the fiscal stimulus rather than increasing could actually decrease what does this entail now these are numbers you know, from quarterly gdp numbers now if if you look at the yellow line the you know this chart looks reasonably flat right now because of the sharp fall but you know india's uh, gdp was falling continuously and it was the government component of gross value added which was actually trying to you know keep the gdp up some sort of a counter cyclical role and this number has fallen in june 20 now if you look at central government numbers central government expenditure has actually gone up so this means that this fall in the government component of gdp has actually come from state governments so you no know, if things were so bad even in june we cannot even imagine how bad they must be right now or how bad they will get once the center you know flatly refuses to compensate state for what for what the constitutionally guaranteed amount to them uh, the biggest question is you know i already i just take 2 3 minutes and try and wrap up uh, why is the government and the bjp not worried and this is something which you know i, I guess nilanjan would you know speak in a lot of detail about uh, but i would you know make very short points you know all said and done this government's political performance the, the bjp's political performance polarization is the biggest political insurance which this government has even between 2014 and 2019 they actually increased the votes so they they votes among hindus from what were already very high level so if you had any doubt as to why the government did the ram temples you no know, bhumi pujan ceremony during a pandemic or why other stuff keeps on happening that is where they draw their votes from and you know this is again from a paper which nilanjan and yamini ayer have written i would encourage you all of you, you know you to read that but the bjp you know the manner in which it has been doing its politics recently it actually draws a huge premium in terms of vote share in national elections than in state elections and nilanjan you know and yamini in the paper explain in a very clear way how this politics works on centralization of welfare benefits So that entire political rhetoric of whether you get a toilet or whether you get a water tap or whether you get anything in this government is because of Prime Minister Modi, and you know, this uh, political campaign is married with what is a very strong grassroots level organization of the BJP and the RSS, 
and that is then sugar coated uh, sugar coated with the hindutva agenda so regional parties in india in 2019 elections their vote share fell to the lowest in a very long time they are actually facing a lot of political squeeze so that way it's getting even more difficult for them to sort of oppose it uh this bit is fine you know but one uh, the last thing i want to say is uh, no government uh, would actually unless you believe that people running the government are sadists and i i am not somebody who believes in conspiracy theories why did this government keep on doing things such as demonetization or goods and services tax the manner in which it is implemented why did it not respond to i mean it is one thing to say that polarization helps you politically but definitely you know it is not the case that if the economy goes from bad to worse that also helps you politically so why does this government take that do that thing uh the answer you no know, the kind of answer which i have i mean all of us have thought over this you know for a very long time and the answer i have come to finally is that you know when narendra modi was fighting the 2014 election the basic thing was that you know the gujarat model of development was coming and there was a lot of debate between, you know before the 14 elections on what the gujarat model was what it was not etc you know i have come to the conclusion 6 years later that there was basically no gujarat model what was the gujarat model narendra modi said that you know gujarat has a lot of industries we get a lot of fdi if you vote me to par you know in delhi the entire country will become like gujarat what happened in gujarat you know gujarat has always been an industrially developed state so there is there is no surprise that it actually was doing very well you know when the indian economy was also doing very well so the basic question is look at the share of manufacturing in gujarat's gdp and this is 2008 9 this is when the international crisis you know hits india india share in manufacturing also goes down gujarat share in manufacturing also goes down if you look at the growth performance it is the same thing so there was absolutely no way in which gujarat's economic performance was you know better or worse or you know or better or worse can be argued but it was not the result of a different kind of economic model and that dogma about you know because modi was winning elections in gujarat that political performance was used to justify the gujarat model of development like you know the 2019 victory has been used to justify the sabka saath sabka vikas model of the modi government at in center india's basic political economic challenge remains the same Our agriculture today gives around 15% of our gdp agriculture today employs around 40% of our country's population as long as we cannot find an alternative source of employment for these people who are basically in, engaged in agriculture but earning very little and doing very little our political economy is not going to be changing and it is in this political economy and i think what nilanjan will explain to you that narendra modi has not derived benefits from what so we a lot of people think is a backlash to globalization but he has coined a completely different kind of what nilanjan calls vishwas over vikas you know to to do his political performance and to you know, keep winning elections etc so this is what i had to argue and you know i'm looking forward to nilanjan's thing and then we can have the more interesting question answer bit thank you sorry for uh, taking 5 minutes extra dipanti no no that's fine we <laughs> thank you so much roshan this was uh, at least it, it helped to get us the economic context uh, in in its full light nilanjan uh, off to you and uh, and that's oh, that you can all see the uh, presentation uh, clearly yes yes okay great uh, so thank you roshan i mean uh, so just uh, as background uh, you know most of you will know that roshan and i have written together for a long time we have traveled around the country together too during election time so i think uh, you know for so it's a big honor to be uh, presenting with him and to all of you but also i think it's kind of nice because we get a chance to sort of uh, talk about our specialties but also this area of overlap because there are a lot of things that uh, roshan and i talk about which are quite overlapping so this talk um, is is titled the politics of vishwas real litigating what we know about india um, it is taking some part of a title from a paper i wrote recently and um you know the motivation for uh, the paper as a whole is a sort of very simple observation right that in 2014 and 2019 you see massive sweeps by the bjp right the saffron areas or or where the bjp wins the seats that the bjp increases its seat tally in 2019 now when it comes to power in 2014 as was mentioned um we hear sabka saath sabka uh, vikas right with everyone uh, development for everyone um in 2019 uh 
फिर सबके साथ सबके विकास और अब सबके विश्वास राइट एंड दिस इज समथिंग मोदी सेड इन सम एंड सो दैट्स द सॉर्ट ऑफ टर्न ऑफ फ्रेज दैट आई बिकम इंटरेस्टेड इन दैट लीडिंग इनटू द 2019 इलेक्शन एज 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 वी हैव जस्ट सीन यू नो प्रेजेंटेड क्वाइट केयरफुली एंड एलोक्वेंटली द इंडियन इकोनॉमी बाय नो मेजर वाज डूइंग पर्टिकुलरली वेल राइट and so if it was the case that uh, a standing government was being judged on vikas and that is what had been promised it's hard to see that this kind of electoral mandate would have come once again so what role does this word vishwas play and you know uh, you know one of course milanji sorry sorry could yes? you get a louder if possible yes yes of course can you hear me clearly now better better thanks <laughs> okay sorry about that um so um you know the core question that i'm asking here is what role does that simple word vishwas play now because i had to write in english you know it does, technically you can say it translates as belief or you know maybe trust more bharosa but but you know actually something more is being encapsulated in that word when we think about religion and so on and so forth so you know um vishwas is sort of a, a a natural word to sort of think about in terms of uh how to distinguish the kind of politics that we are seeing today from what we might imagine as a stylized model of democratic politics or uh, you know sort of political economy um and you know i should also just quickly give credit to you know when we were analyzing 2019 election results my boss at cpr uh, ms yamini ayer was the first one to sort of say look you know i was talking about accountability all these complicated political economy terms that just frame it as vikas versus vishwas everyone will understand what you're talking about uh, and so that ended up becoming the way in which um, a lot of these kind of arguments were framed um okay so i want to start with a very very simple question right and one that is gets to the core of how we think that voters behave so i don't want to go into a lot of theory because i would expect that you know people have certain backgrounds in in particular uh but the standard model that we have of political behavior in democratic societies is one of political accountability in the political accountability model looks something like this. the incumbent government and uh, its challengers make a set of promises i have a certain set of views on exactly what i want out of the next government um and i have a certain set of views as to my own partisan bias to or sort of ideological bias towards this or that i observe the incumbent in whether the, uh, the incumbent government has delivered or not delivered what was promised if something has not been promised i'm less likely to vote them back if something has been promised and given uh, then i'm more likely to vote them okay this is what I, and, and so the basic logic is that i observe a government in power and its ability to deliver on some promises if it does so then uh, i'm happy if it doesn't do so what we call shirking uh then uh, i'm less happy and i'm likely to vote against now uh you know one might sort of think well okay uh let's not look at grand gdp numbers perhaps on some element of uh, economic delivery on schemes or so, so forth um that is where there's some delivery the voter said i saw that lbg sold the shirt up to my home therefore i will vote this government again now that is one plausible story the other story is that people were already drawn to the bjp or drawn to modi and they allow the political narrative they allow the scale of mobilization to tell us a little bit about why i would be voting uh, for the bjp right so it may have been that uh you know uh, a year before the election i would have said you know something about development then maybe i would have said something about balakot then i would have said something about schemes 
And so when we start seeing a lot of volatility in what somebody says is their most important issue, which is something we see in Indian political, public opinion data, then we start thinking it's not the voter who has very fixed views on what he or she wants to see from the government. It is, in fact, political elites and the media space that are dictating the political narrative and voters are reflecting. Right? So it's flipping the logic. It's not that I wanted to see a scheme, had the BJP not delivered the scheme, I would have voted the BJP out. It is that I like the BJP, I like Modi. Now, whatever Modi does, I'm going to attribute, and whatever Modi does well, I'm going to attribute that as the reason for the for that person. And so as you can imagine, this is a logic that requires some understanding about the means of communication, about control uh, over the means of communication, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. Um, and this is just some very quick data. Um, we know that what we have seen since 2014 is a massive advantage for the BJP and the Congress when it comes to head-to-head -head elections, less so when it comes to um, other parties it's competing against. But these are quite impressive numbers, as the maps might suggest, and it does suggest that um, if we are thinking about Vishwas as a model of politics, it has been remarkably effective as an electoral tool. So what is sort of new in a theory of Vishwas and, 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 and politics? You know, after, after all, we've seen many, many charismatic leaders all around the world and in India, many, many people voting for Gandhi, Nehru, Mayavati, and you name, right? So what is new about thinking about a theory like this, right? So the first is just, um, you know, a core intellectual point, right? That we in the academic and media space disproportionate, even if we understand that personal charisma matters and campaigning and mobilization matters, we disproportionately attribute political behavior to issues. The BJP lost because of onion prices, right? Standard kind of thing, right? Why don't we ever think about all of the campaigning that had gone around in 2004, all the more complicated ways in which political issues were framed towards voters and how that structured views, uh, right? The second important thing about thinking about this kind of critique of Vishwas as a principle of politics is that it gives us a role for communication between the leader, perhaps using social media, perhaps using political mobilization, with the voter, right? And that's important because we do tend to think that in the last decade, the role of the media space is an important characteristic in some of the changes we're seeing in politics all around. Um, the second set of questions that I can sort of address, you know, relatively quickly um, in thinking about a politics of Vishwas is to think a little bit about what explains, um, you know, uh, political centralization in Modi uh, in India. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, critiques of secularism, multiculturalism, federalism, and some of the things that we saw in, in, in Okay, so I told you a little bit about what um, a theory of Vikas might look like, right? The democratic accountability. You promised something in the economy to me. I said, uh, you know, I got it or I didn't get it and I vote you back or I vote you back. What does a theory of Vishwas look like? So I'm going to talk about sort of various elements of this. So the first thing that we see, um, and this is from the World Values Survey, um, which has been collecting in some five-year rounds uh, data on India since the late 1980s. Um, we do see that at least um, in terms of survey response, the proportion of people saying that religion, and remember uh, citing religion as being important in your identity is very much a political tool, um, is spiking um, in the last decade, right? The last round that we have, 2010, 2014, we start seeing well over 80% of people uh, believing that uh, religion is important for raising their children. And that's jumping up from numbers in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, right? So we see a huge spike, right? Um, we're seeing similar spikes. It was already high, but it's uh, become over 90%. Percentage of people reporting the importance of religion in their personal lives. 
Now, this is important because, you know, when we think a little bit about, you know, why, um, you know, we start seeing some kind of centralization in, in, in the Indian polity, we have to think a little bit about why people might be frustrated with what had been in India before. So, you know, Samuel Huntington, great political scientist, problematic in a number of ways, but he uh, did envision that after the end of the Cold War, early 1990s onwards, we would increasingly see conflict between the view of a single national identity, something like Hindutva, Hindu national, and multiculturalism in a broader sense, which can be global in nature or it can be domestic in nature. Now, one of the ways this frustration manifests itself is that decision-making is too slow. I have to negotiate with Muslims and Dalits and upper castes and Christians, and it's a complicated, various states have regional interests, so on and so forth. So once you have a frustration with secular thought, with compromising across different identities, then the impetus for centralizing in the polity Right, so there's some interest in centralizing decision making, centralizing a person, centralizing a set of people. They make a decision; it's immediate, and you see that kind of language. In you know, we've struck back in Ladakh, we've made a sudden change in Kashmir. You see, the suddenness, the decisiveness, is an important criterion for the political messaging that exists today. The second thing, which I think is you know fairly confirmatory evidence, is that. We can look at countries that um, have seen recent rise of sort of populist, um, you know, sort of centralized leaders, and you can see that India has by far the highest percentage of people who report um, support for rule by a quote unquote strong leader. By the way, if you look at this way, all of this data is collected before Modi is elected. This is telling you that the groundwork is being laid for the kind of centralization of politics that we see, right? And so the piece that kind of war puts this together, say, okay, there is an underlying desire for centralization. Now I need an individual in which I can put enough trust in for that person to make decisions for me and the polity as a whole. And so that is essentially the kind of game that I'm sort of playing with when I think about Vishwas in the Indian politics. And the last sort of, I think, major prong that I want to talk about is the theory of Vishwas, and then I'm going to sort of move fairly quickly to talk about some empirical results, is that if it is indeed the case, this model works on the centralization of power in someone that you trust, right, in someone that you believe, then the power of that individual, in this case, Modi, emanates from the ability to continually invent and reinvent trust in yourself, which means you need to directly control the means of communication between yourself and the voters at large. So um, some of the things that we can talk about, which um, you know, are used, and, and many of you know these arguments, um, media dominance in popular media, the role of echo chambers, we have so much choice, WhatsApp, Facebook groups, so the ability of people to be logged into news sources that are explicitly biased in particular ways, so we call it an echo chamber, right? A large party machinery, Pandha Pramukhs, you know, large numbers of party workers in every village, and the level of electoral financing that is required for that purpose, you know, and we know there's been a lot of discussion of, of, of campaign finance laws. These are all things I can talk about separately. Um, and the subsuming of political mobilization in the service of one individual. Now, there are many, many quotes during the 2019 election for this. This is one from Nirmala Sivaram, right, who is now a finance minister, but before was defense. Um, I'm going to say this in every place that I go, um, where B2B uh, candidates are contesting, that people have to vote for Modi, not the candidate. Uh, when you choose the Lotus, it is your direct vote to elect Modi. It is the subsuming of political mobilization in one person, centralization. One person. Okay, so let's very quickly talk about uh, what the empirical uh, uh, implications of this are. And I, I know I have about two minutes, so I'm just going to go through this quickly. And I would like you to look at the top row here. This is some analysis of first time voters, um, which is less interesting. 
what you can see here, and I'm just simply looking at turnout change with respect to the previous election. So in 1999, the BJP is the incumbent. As turnout change grows, the BJP has a lower probability. In 2004, the BJP uh, is the incumbent. As turnout change grows, the BJP has a uh, lower chance of winning. In 2014, we can't use uh, 2009 because the boundaries change in, in electoral constituencies. BJP is the challenger, and you see as turnout change grows, the BJP's popularity grows significantly. It says that the traditional pattern that we have in data as far back as we can go, especially since the BJP became competitive, is that increases in turnout at the constituency level from one election to the next have been correlated with vote shares for the opposition. Basically, the politics of Vikas says that when you are frustrated with the incumbent, you are more likely to turn out. So therefore, when I see greater turnout, I'm just to push the incumbent out. All of the, all, in all of these cases, turnout change is associated with anti incumbency Okay, and this is just, um, you know, some data showing that, you know, in Modi Wave in 2014, there's a strong relationship between turnout change and vote Come to 2019, we see the logic flips. The BJP is the incumbent, increase in turnout predicts an increase in the probability of the BJP winning. It has completely flipped the logic from the logic of democratic accountability, the logic of Vikas, right? People turning out because they're upset with the way the incumbent government has performed. The BJP uh, has not performed well in the economy, yet nonetheless, when people are turning out, they're turning out um, and supporting people. A couple of things very quickly, literally uh, 30 seconds. We actually see that the uh, BJP's margins of victory actually grow in rural areas. And we thought that rural distress was one of the biggest problems coming into the 2019 election. That's also where the turnout is growing the most, right? So these are perhaps places where the BJP is more able to mobilize voters because it's easier to mobilize in a village context than in an urban context, potentially, given the kind of structure that many of these parties have. Um, but it's certainly not the case that people are responding to rural distress um, when it comes to um, what the patterns that we see in, in, in rural India. And by the way, this is the topic of a piece that Rosher and I have written in December. So some final thoughts. So we know that we are now in a, in a, in a, in a place of uh, extreme political centralization. We're hearing today that GST money is not going to be given back state, which uh, says something about fiscal federalism. We know the kinds of decisions that were made vis-a-vis uh, -vis Kashmir, and we know in a number of other cases, um, we are seeing political centralization on the one hand and intimidation of political opponents on the other. And this is often seen as a classic signal of democratic backsliding. It's not the topic of this, uh, of this talk, I'm happy to talk about more, but that is a big issue. Another sort of question that we one may want to ask is, when does this all end? This is, a, this is fine, you know, but does this, are we all constantly locked into a model of Vishwas? If it has come, will it ever end? The only thing that I would say is that something like this is incredibly expensive to uh, fund. Um, fund and promote this, this kind of, uh, you know, you, you know uh, organization down to the ground. You need to constantly invent sources of money. And we know that we're in a severe economic downturn. That's what Roshan has shown us. And the challenge is, can the BJP continue to come up with money? I think this is the backstory behind some of the things that we're seeing with Ambani and Adani. And I would encourage you, and I have not written this paper yet, but paper I'm interested in writing, looking at what the privatization of state assets in post-communist Russia and Soviet Union looked like, and the nexus that, uh, that was created between using essentially not just looking at political connections between business leads, but the actual privatization or the connection between public-private partnerships uh, with the state and how certain businesses are able to benefit financially from that and then put money back in. Um, I'm not going to talk about the paradox of state performance. I think Roshan covered that. Uh, but anyways, these are, I thought, some, some more general thoughts that one can sort of take beyond the analysis. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Nilanjan. This was 
truly very, uh, in, not only I think I would say insightful, but it is so rich in its uh, content that that I think we need we need a little bit of time to uh, absorb uh, because I was I was busy just taking notes uh, from from each uh, passing. So so glad that you could make it for today. Um, so we have, uh, I mean, we already uh, have questions flowing in. Um, see, <laughs> there, are, there are students even requesting for uh, course, almost coercively for your PowerPoints uh, to, to be used, I think in their own class group presentations. But leaving that aside, I think that there are the questions that I would, uh, I'll keep a few points that, that I had um, to uh, more as, uh, you know, observations or questions uh, towards the later half if there is time but uh, allow me to, to relay some of the questions that our students had put in uh, for you guys. Um, uh, okay, let me start in the reverse order, uh, if that's all right uh, with Roshan, that we'll start with, with some questions that Nilanjan are addressed in Nilanjan, right, if that's okay. Um, so one of the questions is, uh, Shiva asked this, how relevant are psychological projections in uh, the current post-truth uh, scenario and in an era on extreme political uh, you know, consolidation or centralization as one is seeing. Uh, that's one. So maybe I think it's better, Nilanjit, uh, if you could take a, a couple of questions and then probably collectively respond to them if that, that's all right. Um, yeah, so when I ask this question, uh, which is addressed to you, how concerning do you believe the appeal to religion, secularism is over raw economic numbers or data or issue basically, issue based projections uh, running rampant in relation to nation's advancement on the global stage. Multiple reports have come out stating that we satisfy many conditions uh, as being one of the emerging economic uh, powers. Uh, your thoughts would be greatly appreciated on this. Um, so there's one question on this uh, political centralization, the other is, uh, which is related to the psychological considerations. And uh, yeah, one which is a question on the role of media, uh, that is what role has media played in uh, misinterpreting some of the concerns, uh, regional concerns as some form of centrifugal forces aiding uh, secession. Uh, I think these, these are, I mean, the ones to get started with and otherwise, the questions we have framed, I think we'll keep, keep, keep coming in from here. Okay. Uh, so let me just uh, take first the earlier set of questions about psychological projections, the role of religion, secularism, and centralization. Um, and then um, the question about media, I'll, I'll sort of end with, I think it actually uh, speaks to something Roshan might be better at answering that, that, than me. So, you know, First of all, you know, this question about cephalogical projections on so on. So, I mean, uh, my own view is that um, they matter in so far as there's some agreement, right? So, in other words, if there's some truth value that is being disseminated in projections, then perhaps people are going to strategically vote one way or another. But Otherwise, you know, I think that we are, you know, well past the point of people basing uh, political uh, decisions at scale on, you know, what pollsters coming in from Delhi are telling. Uh, more than anything, I think um, cephalogical projections are a certain kind of almost religious festival. It's just something that we enjoy doing. I, I'm, I'm not totally convinced that they have the kind of that sometimes people fear. Um, when it comes to sort of questions of the discussion of religion and secularism vis-a-vis -vis economics, uh, the questions of political centralization, I mean, I think, you know, we have a couple of striking images and actually one of them in my piece on Bodhis of Vishwas I end with, right, which is the, the day that uh, Modi's seat is up for uh, election, right, he's meditating in a cave. Right, while polling agents are doing all kinds of making all kinds of crazy phone calls, this, that, that's the image you have of Modi. Now you have the image of Modi doing a puja in IoT. Now, what is the importance of all of this, right? 
So I think two things, right? I think religious filiality is different than political connection, especially in a place like India where, where political candidates can jump from one party to the next, they can push support from one party to the next. It's much harder to leave a religion than it is to leave a party, right? Uh, and so insofar as some kind of religious authority is being projected, um, that is an important part of grasping hold I think other I'll just very quickly say, and Roshan has heard me say this before, and I genuinely believe this. Any of you who are looking to become the next great political, the next uh, most important political scientist of a generation, there's a book that needs to be written that I'm thoroughly incapable of writing, right? Which is what is the connection between this rising sentiment for Babas and you know this kind of thing that we sort of leaders on the ground. It is a structural form of politics that we know exists on a local level in India. And I do see in structure and form many of the visions that we, that, that just the media portrayals of Modi having similarities, right? And so somebody who's able to really grapple with what that is um, and what the role of, 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 of a religious leader in that sense is, is I think going to make the next big contribution to our, our understanding of now, when it comes to sort of, you know, what is what role does the media play? So there's a there's a lot to talk about the media, and you know, I mean, there, you know, I teach a class on some of this stuff. So let me just sort of start with one small point and end with you know, uh, uh, something that I think I think might draw out the distinction. Okay. So imagine that a news channel is trying to tell me about something that is happening in my mohalla or in my colony or something. I have independent, uh, I am able to independently verify whether that's true or false, right? It's much harder for you to tell me something that I can independently verify. I can figure out what the truth value of that statement is. But now if I tell you something about Ladakh, right? Or I tell you something about Kashmir, I have much more power as the media to construct a political narrative. And I think one of the most spectacular versions of this that we have seen, and this is why I said Roshan will be able to, Roshan is a more careful watcher of Bihar politics than I am. Um, all of this crazy politics around the case of Sushant Singh Rajput. I have no idea what has happened there. I don't think that's, you know, you know it's, that's, that's, that's irrelevant. I was talking to another analyst that the most important thing for the BJP to have gained out of this is that nobody talked about the migrant crisis. I mean, it's quite extraordinary, right, that after the migrant crisis, the speed with which this takes over the news cycle in Bihar and completely diverts attention from the ability to sort of think about certain kinds of really core economic issues. And I think that we're starting to think a little bit now about real, the, the genuine capacity of um, a coordinated media campaign and net political narrative to divert your attention away from things that we would see as very, very severe economic issues that would normally affect political outcomes. Yeah. I don't have an answer there, but I used to say that, I mean, I think in some sense, I could still have imagined like some kind of war with Pakistan thing taking over the airwaves, right? And I think, but, uh, you know, Bollywood actor suicide and some, you know, and being able to use that as a, as, as a political tool is extraordinary. Right, and it tells you something quite extraordinary about about the level of media and political control that exists. So we'll uh, leave my comments there. Okay, that's uh, so. Let me just move on because the the, the question is flowing in, but we we have a few that we wanted to get in uh, in place, and this is let me come to come to Roshan for these. Uh, so the first question, Roshan, is a little bit around. Uh, so you've talked about uh, the fiscal composition issue and, and the concern around having a weak tax awareness. And these are questions that have been out there for, for, in fact, I would say probably a few years now. Um, how do you see uh, the, the breakdown in the center state relationship uh, as the way we see this unfolding right now? Uh, to be concerned with some of the more structural uh, issues of a poor GST uh, implementation uh, cycle. A second, uh, having an extremely 
uh, skewed tax structure which relies a lot on indirect uh, tax revenue because given the fact that at the stage of development we are we've not done enough to to undertake the direct tax that reforms and you've written about this in terms of the tax breaks that were given in the corporate sector before Modi was making his visit to the U.S. Um, and you know, a few of others uh, us that time pointed the same issue that we are weakening our direct tax base in the hope that the indirect tax uh, structure would. Now that that we are facing this concern in the service sector and a few others, so how do you see the the the, the breakdown in this central state relationship in the federal polity as a direct consequence of this uh, economic uh, relationship? That's one. The second uh, point of query, just following up from, from your um, work, and I think that is one of the areas which has uh, been a focus of a lot of our discussion, the past dialogues, is what's really likely to happen with the agricultural sector? How much of a change do you see? Because if you really ask, and I mean, we've been doing work with farmers around a few areas, so it's interesting because Politically speaking, people are very clear on what their preference is. But it seems that on the side of the nature of uh, policy recourse or you know, crop insurance mechanisms or direct benefit transfers, there is this sense of realization that there's not much being done and we're not likely to benefit much out of it. So it's like, uh, you know, we like the, the leader in, 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 in the sense but we don't expect a lot to really change. Um, so in agricultural policy, uh, what do you see? I mean, the, the two specific questions would be how successful do you think this set of reforms around contract farming or, uh, you know, the, the release of accessibility of, uh, you know, price autonomy to farmers to be able to sell the product at the price that they want. Um, or the change in the MSP segment is going to really make a difference unless you don't have accompanying reforms around land acquisition, for example, which are most of the issues related to states uh, and APMC, APMCs as well. These are all issues that you will feel that the center state relationship needs to be far more robust to, to ensure it. So in fact, both are entwined. Um, if you see that both questions do have a reliance on what the federal structure and its robustness has to do. If you could respond to these and then we'll follow up. Thank you, Dipanshu. Uh, I think Dipanshu was being polite and he did not ask me the question about media, but I you know, answer that very briefly also. No, no, you should. So here is the thing. I have, I have a difficult job in squeezing all the questions. All right. so just take the liberty to sure. respond to any question that is related to Neelan. Uh, no, uh, let me use the, no, uh, the, the usual caveat. I'm, I'm representing myself and I'm not representing Hindustan Times. So whatever I say is to be attributed to me. Uh, uh, no, frankly, I think uh, you can hear me, right? Just give me a second. We can hear you clearly. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're good. I think, you're good. You know, uh, I think, I think television news has gone mad. I, there's no other word to sort of describe it. What has been happening to the Sushant Singh? But let us not forget that that kind of news actually has demand because you know if there's one thing which TV news really cares about it is TRPs because that is where the money is. So there is that kind of demand. Uh, so I think the larger crisis what we are you know, trying to talk about the media is you know and you know, probably there's some sort of an admission that the moral compass is weakened. I do not think the media alone is facing that crisis today. Every institution of importance in this country from the Supreme Court to the Election Commission to the media to the Competition Commission you name it. And there's a, there's a crisis of moral compass there. I think Pratap Banu Mehta wrote a very you know, nice piece a couple of weeks ago. I mean, it speaks, you know, I spent three, three and a half months in the United States and I've come back here. It is not that the quote unquote liberal ecosystem there is all hunky dory, but their elite have definitely shown more of a moral courage in trying to take on the regime than our elite have shown. I, and I don't want to add more to it. Let us come to the fiscal federalism question. I have absolutely no idea what is going to happen because you know the center even before coming to the second GST council meeting has been using BJP government to try and accept its decision that it is not going to be thing. Uh, the states have every right to demand that money because that money is something which the center guaranteed. Now you can say that 14% is not valid to us for this time. There was an overestimation bias to begin with. All those criticisms are right but once that deal has been done the center is obliged to honor it. 
If it does not do it, I don't know what is going to happen. We cannot rule out a breakdown of the GST structure. The, the adverse consequences of this kind of a breach of trust by the center is, and no, and fiscal federalism's first crisis is not the pandemic. I mean, the kind of things that this government has been doing, the, you know, it, it, every election rally, Modi goes to, he says that we've given 42% of central share to taxes. Yamni Ayer wrote a column in the Sun Times yesterday. That share of central taxes never reached 42%. It peaked at 35% and it has fallen very sharply in the last couple of years. So states have every reason to feel very angry with the center. I don't know what is going to happen. What I know is going to happen is states will not have money to spend. Economy will sink further. This I can say with a lot of conviction. Uh, agriculture sector, uh, uh, you know, one of the uh, you know, uh, the political strategies of this regime has also been that it, it, it invents demons where there are none. You know, the kind of political rhetoric which the BJP uses is, it is as if you know, India were North Korea before 2014. Between 1991 and 2014, I think our economy had completely liberalized. I mean, there were some APMC laws, etc. You know, in agriculture, but none of it actually, I mean, it will take a very big leap of faith to believe that farmers in this country were not not free to sell their produce to private traders. Every credible researcher, I mean, Mekala Krishnamurti has done it at CPR. I mean, she's an anthropologist. She goes to Swamitro, has looked at it. A state like Bihar actually abolished its APMC Act in 2004. So agriculture's you know, solution to agriculture's problems are not to be found in getting rid of APMC Acts or stuff like that. Agriculture has a simple problem in our country. It employs far too many people. It cannot generate economic rewards for them. Far too many people are very poor in our country. They spend at least half of their earnings on just buying their food. So we, you know, everybody who is listening to this seminar comes from a very different socioeconomic background. Imagine spending half of your monthly salary on food. What does that mean? That basically means that there is a lot of political demand in this country that food prices should never go up. If food prices do not go up, farmers never get remunerative prices. And what one thing which has changed in this period in agriculture is, you know, if you went to a farmer in say 1990, he would get his seed from you know local village or use his you know last crop seeds etc. The input market in agriculture has become completely commercialized. So input prices increase, output prices do not increase. When they increase, there's a huge political backlash. Then all hell breaks loose. Your onions are imported from Pakistan and Turkey and whatnot. And farmers are caught in a fix. Unless we break this vicious cycle, we are not going to get rid of problems in the agriculture sector. There are two solutions to it. One, and I've been arguing for it for a long time, we should extend our PDS from rice and wheat to at least edible oils, pulses and vegetables. Two, you have to generate more manufacturing jobs. There's no other solution to it. Alvina asked a question I, I saw in the chat box. You know, and this is directed at both Nilanjan and me. She asked me whether it was you know, what we are seeing today is a backlash against neoliberalism and ideas of the French Revolution and secularism, etc. I would pass on the Enlightenment and French Revolution question to Nilanjan. But Alvina, I don't uh, think we are seeing a backlash against neoliberalism. What we are seeing is, or, or, or rather what Modi had very clear, cleverly milked is, that he told that, you know, the reason the economy tanked was not because in 2008 there was a global crisis and the only exogenous factor of our growth was actually taken away from us. The economy tanked because the Congress was a corrupt government. Now the same corrupt government oversaw a period of you no know, massive economic boom for the 10 years and people seem to have believed that. So they have believed that it is only under Modi that the economy can do well. What we are seeing in my view is a desperate urge for that status quo ante to be restored. And I don't think that is going to happen. Okay, so just to follow up on that, uh, Roshan, and I think I'll just uh, uh, say a couple of questions to both of you and then you can have your remarks. We still have around 15, 20 minutes, so that's good. Okay, so the first uh, point is a little bit related to around the composition of demand. Um, and that's been a subject of attention for a lot of economists. In fact, mostly those working around public policy, uh, talking about how See, recently, I mean, there's this data that Bloomberg Quint also cited, which is about how digital uh, purchases have increased as an overall, you know, part of the consumption expenditure, even though, uh, you know, it doesn't capture a huge proportion of the population which does not have access uh, to digital uh, mediums for expenses. But in order to look at two uh, related points, which is one around... Uh, 
increasing or widening the demand base um, and trying to increase consumption expenditure, uh, what kind of measures do you think that the government can consider? I mean, if you were in just in a role play exercise as a policymaker and you had to kind of think about these ABC areas of focus, what uh, would be the, 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 the focal point of, of government priority? The second is uh, the question around uh, uh, unemployment, which is, that's a concern which if you really look at, uh, was facing the, the Indian economy way before uh, the, the pandemic as well. And in fact, given the fact there's not been much to address the first problem, you have now a situation where the unemployment problem is going to get far worse, even within the organized sector. Uh, and the more resilient, uh, unorganized informal sector has been seen a complete decimation. So uh, what would you suggest in terms of, uh, you know, uh, incentives that can allow for um, uh, the employment scenario to, to improve? Uh, is it something that you feel ultimately relies on what the states can or cannot do? I mean, PR elections are coming up, even though there's not that may be addressed. I mean, Miranjan's presentation is talking about that maybe issue-based considerations may not be that important going into the election or I don't know. But unemployment is actually a big uh, concern, which is which is making... Um, a lot of people to be wary about why do we need to migrate out of the state in the first place? Uh, because and the condition seems to be not that good when they're traveling to Maharashtra, Gujarat and other states. So on employment and composition of demand, these two for, for Russian. Uh, Nirunjan, I mean, just if I can, um, there are a couple of questions which I had actually even discussed um, at length with uh, Professor Mehta earlier. And I'm just going to take a little bit of liberty to raise them with you because we, we had so many questions around our discussion with him that we couldn't discuss all and I thought it would be nice to relay. Um, one is uh, this, this, this uh, question around, um, uh, just a second. Yeah, the one is this question around looking at the, uh, you know, political economy landscape uh, as the weight has emerged since the CA and RC protests. Um, uh, so since the early weeks of CA and RC protests, uh, there has been an increased level of distrust seen in the state citizen contract in the sense of the way, I mean, you may argue that probably it's not the entire core, but you just see that there is that breakdown in social cohesion, uh, which is feeding well into the political narrative, but it's just something which is happening. But this is also tied with the breakdown in the private-public investment uh, relationship that has been uh, triggering a lot of discord uh, in private investors outside and, in fact, in India uh, in trying to ask the question whether India in the long-term, medium to long-term space is actually a reliable market to invest. Those questions were actually addressed more in case of China before uh, um, rather than a country like India because people used to go big. Um, how do you see this, uh, or, or how do you see this, this change in the social fabric feeding into what you would consider as a void uh, in the economic uh, milieu, uh, even though the state business relationship that you've spoken about, Dani and Ambani, uh, coming into the folio and trying to uh, ensure that there is, you know, that void that has been created is being captured by other business houses. Um, the question here would be that how are these two forces entwined? Um, that's one. And the, and, the, and the second point was largely looking at a little bit of this point that you raised, and that's being inquisitive, actually, uh, me as well, is, a, the, is the yogification or uh, spiritualization of political uh, imaging, you know, and, and, and the idea of having a leader who personifies a certain kind of a lifestyle where uh, it seems that the person's only devotion is not to any form of quote unquote material accumulation, but towards um, community service. And at least if that seems to be the projection that is being portrayed, uh, to be honest, at the local level, this was always popular. But now you're seeing this is amplified right at the top. Do you think this is something which is going to be a phenomena because there is this revival of this traditionalism uh, and, and our own cultural homogenization of whether, uh, you know, having this uh, 
kind of a lifestyle is seen as a as a more ideal way of being in politics um so is that is there is, is there certain some thoughts that you want to relay of those okay with that i'll let uh, uh, both of you respond uh, and we'll, we'll close then around the so with motion you can go ahead first yeah please uh, yeah all right uh, so uh, let's take the demand question first uh, uh, take an elementary example a month from now we will have durga puja uh, you know for for the poorest of the poor who have lost their jobs etc i mean the the, the the crunch question will come to whether you buy an you know additional dress for your child so whether you buy a new pair of slippers i mean this is what we have in mind when we mean mass demand that that we were talking uh, if that worker has no no job no salary I and mean, what do you do I, i think the immediate thing to do is you know if he saves say 100 rupees 200 rupees on buying vegetables or pulses i mean he's getting rice and wheat from the government that is i i i think the importance of that intervention cannot be overestimated i mean if the government had not done that we would we would be witnessing mass starvation in this country the immediate way to boost demand is that Uh, another way and i talk about it in my paper is you have to do something about the health system in this country mm-hmm. india you know world bank data shows that in terms of out of pocket spending in total health spending we our share is way above all kinds of countries developed countries china etc i think education and health i mean every poor person in this country especially in education spends beyond their means because that is one aspiration which they have you know, we were recently looking at education numbers you know english medium education the manner in which it is just picked up among poor people if you have you no know, an extended pds if you have a good public provisioning of you know health and education in this country i think that will give a lot of boost to additional demand in this country because basically those poor people will have more money to buy that additional dress buy that additional pair of slippers you no know, no buy maybe a scooter or a motorcycle or whatever you like to call it what the government has been trying to do is you know it has been trying to you know put hope in the demand of the rich you know we will give you emi you buy a car that kind of development is not going to be happening even if you know prices come down the upper middle class the rich they are actually going to be saving because you know they are used to a certain standard of living there is no way they are going to be compromising that what we call in economics as precautionary savings are you know, must have increased. every corporate sector company in this country has given a salary cut and all of us know that so you know precautionary savings are going to be very high how do we do what do we do about employment i think employment you know once again the importance of energy cannot be overemphasized had that not been there we would be seeing a far worse situation in our villages than what we have today but you know there are talks of you know, an urban employment guarantee i mean in principle sympathetic to the idea but we cannot be under the illusion that an employment guarantee program is a solution to india's employment problem it cannot be if we want to solve our employment problem we actually have to look at commercially viable economic activities primarily has to be manufacturing can be in other areas also that will not happen unless we either have export demand or we have domestic demand given the kind of global economic outlook we are living in today i do not see export demanding reviving at all i mean it was not reviving even before the pandemic now we can pretty much kiss goodbye to it that is not happening only way to revive employment is to revive domestic demand in the economy and there you have to focus on the demand of the not so rich people uh no i also want to come in on the you know, the political discussion which we were having you know especially bihar etc and you know nilanjan's work you know where he actually says that it is vishwas over vikas is truly insightful and you know i and nilan we have done a lot of election trips together our reporting trips we have written our findings together but you know, and you know a paper has certain limitations you can only cover so much ground in the paper but i think one thing where we have given a free pass in this country is this country's opposition i mean you know a lot of people especially in the liberal ecosystem say that we have never had a government which was this bad or authoritarian and all kinds of adjectives are used i think we have never had an opposition which is so inept in the history of this country i mean you can talk about the congress leadership which is supposedly the main national opposition party to the bihar leadership i mean let us talk about but what did the opposition do when demonetization happened for two months there was complete chaos in this country what did the political opposition do when that lockdown was imposed i mean millions of workers were marching they were dying on the roads i mean literally what did we do so 
you know politics you know if it is a one horse race then no matter how bad the horse is that horse will keep on winning because as of now there is not even a semblance of a political challenge to the bjp there could be reasons you know media could be biased the bjp has more money than it has but ultimately you know it's a political context and if the opposition keeps making excuses the bjp is going to keep on winning and the bjp is pretty happy about it you know the other question you know dipanchu which you were talking to nilan jan you know about this thing that modi doesn't have a family etc uh, i don't think it's a new thing in india i mean i mean if you look at the leadership of the communist party especially in west bengal where you know, the cpm ruled for more than three decades i mean it was actually you know uh, considered a premium if you, if you did not marry and become a party whole time because you know, the entire logic that you will be completely devoted to the party etc so in india yes we have that kind of idealism etc but so basically i think you know the kind of political economy trajectory india has locked itself in and i think this is what nilanjan's you know, paper tries to bring out that we are you know entering into a certain kind of a gridlock where democratic accountability is going down we will have elections on paper but actually not much will change if we want to get out of that phase it actually requires a very big political push today i do not see india's political opposition i forget capable i don't think it you know it even intending to change that you no know, i am a journalist and you are a professor nilanjan is a researcher when competition does something better i mean all of us lose our you know night sleep so that how do i you know meet my competition i don't think india's political opposition cares too bit about the bjp success I mean, they are living happily with their own life etc they don't care what the bjp is doing so if this is the state of political competition what do you expect in this country so i mean how do you see the i mean just on before nilanjan speaks how do you see the uh, the rise of Uh, the protest movements that came after cnrc that almost surprised even the bjp in that regard it no was... but those protest movements helped bjp i mean look at, i mean no, no. they ultimately consequentially... created in delhi riots yeah yeah the consequentially they did if you look at yeah. that period of time just basically if you go back to november december january in fact those three months it seemed that uh, i think the, the the national at least core didn't have much of a response to how to understand and what was happening i mean february onwards if you see with donald trump's visit to india and then the pandemic narrative coming in and then utilizing what was happening uh you see that there was a conscious effort to 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 drive back the whole protest movement you know there there are the i get a, i get a point on the political opposition uh, part where you're saying that you the opposition failed in some way also to utilize the protests uh to be able to create a genuine discord against uh let's say the regime uh rather than just you know a number of factors i mean we saw i saw it like that in chain bag totally every day there was a new appropriation of a new set of voices no, i i i get what you're saying yeah. let me try and answer that and that will be as blunt as possible <laughs> i don't think the bjp cares too about two hoots about what the muslims think of the bjp the bjp's model at you know, i think the best example of it was the 2014 and they did not field even one lok sabha candidate over the muslim so, so the messaging is clear it is not just muslims in 2019 everybody was expecting the sp bsp alliance will do wonders you know because you had two sizable cross groups they said we don't want the other board we don't want jata board you can take the vote for yourself they contest for the 60 to 65% vote get a 50 55% vote out of the, the vote share out of that vote and they win election so as morally reprehensible as uh, you know uh, inimical to the long term interest the unity and integrity of this country the bjp's politics is they deliberately kept the bhumi pujan state on the anniversary of the revocation of article yeah, yeah, yeah. you know yeah, hindu that, that, priests you know a lot of hindu priests have actually argued that it was not an auspicious date because you know the month of shravan was over etc Religi- religiosity might not detain us here but the bjp's messaging is if you want to take on the bjp on the on on only the question of hindu muslim issues the bjp is going to be pretty happy about that is what the bjp wants so the final not saying the final should not oppose the, those policies. yeah so the final point would be and i think here nilanjan can come in and i think we will we'll end with his final thoughts how do you see aap's victory then uh, to explain as the conundrum because aap tried to appropriate this hindu uh, i mean i was seeing kejriwal completely changing the way he was even right now <laughs> there is this focus a lot on trying to understand that i mean there is this hindufication uh, mindset that you seen that the aap is trying to appropriate as well even during the covid they were trying to present them as you know kind of alternatives so how do you see a state 
victory like that of the AAP uh, saying anything if it does about the political uh, scenario. Just um, two points and then Nilan can take. Yeah, yeah, and I, I probably I want uh, Nilanjan just if you can. Yeah. So these are questions all there. I'm not able to take the names of the students, but I think these are all here. So yeah. You know, frankly, you know uh, what the AAP has done on the Hindutva issue. You know, Hanuman for Ram and their conduct after the Delhi riot, etc. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think it is very different from what everybody else has been doing. I mean, Rahul Gandhi went to every significant temple in this country before the 19th election. Started from Gujarat, it's all seen all that. So, I don't expect them to do anything else. Uh, the AAP, that way, is a remarkably honest party. They don't believe in any ideology. Their only ideology is Bigli and Pani. And I think it would be unfair to the AAP to not attribute their victory to their performance. When they yeah, 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 yeah. Totally, 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 totally. Go ahead, Netflix, please. <laughs> uh so i you know i think what i will do a little bit is uh, actually play a little bit of economist because i got a lot of you know so i think we can have roshan and i switch roles a little bit you know so just one thing very quickly on uh, you know issues of demand and consumption so you know i've been doing some survey work around uh, covid and it's still sort of ongoing but the one thing that a lot of the data is starting to show and uh, i'm not the first one to see this is that Technically speaking, in terms of employment, you're not seeing huge drops. What you're seeing is big drops in the amount of income that you can take, given the fact that you're right? That's where the variation is. Now, the reason for that is something very specific, and I'm going to tie it to, I think, a larger point in, in the questions you asked me, right? The reason is, some, reason is something very specific, right? Which is that we know that manufacturing is low in India. We know that, um, you know, why is it that so many people want Sarkari jobs? It's because it's a stable job, it's mass employment, right? So when you don't have the kinds of uh, industries that create that kind of a massive shift in the employment structure, a disproportionate number of your, of your work, uh, worker population is essentially working piece rate, contract rate, entrepreneurial, right? set of, uh, you know, something that looks beyond basic salaried employment, right? And so you have this sort of very strange thing, right? Where um, huge hits can be taken in the economy or, or, or are being taken in the economy and you have massive swings because obviously if such a large percentage of your population is engaged in that kind of activity, then uh, there is no sort of stable source of mass employment. Right? So, I mean, I think, I think you know, there's a, there's a larger question about where India is going. And, you know, I, the way I often teach this or lecture about this is say that, you know, if you look at the literature of urbanization, urban growth in the 1950s and 60s, what has happened in India, which is one of the fastest urbanizing, uh, well, who knows what will happen to but one of the fastest urbanizing countries in the world, uh, technically speaking is that you never would have imagined uh, a model of urbanization without industrial growth. The reality is that our model of urbanization is just lack of agriculture and people going and working in real estate sites. You know, the construction sites, that that's not what was intended by the model of sort of industrialization and urban growth, right? And so I think that throws up questions for, um, you know, the sort of larger sort of sustainability, uh, uh, of an economy like this to handle shocks like the ones that we've seen. Okay. Now, I, I mean, I think the reason why I bring this sort of question up is that as uh, we are in an economic uh, universe uh, that post mid 90s onwards, certainly neoliberalism, certainly the rise of capital, has had certain impacts in the way that politics is done. Um, and uh, some of the pathologies of this kind of rise of capital. So when you asked me about the investment scenario, right, in India, so the way, to, uh, the way that I think about what has happened with Adani and Ambani is that it's not, right, it's not capital in the, in, in the service of competition. Mm. It's capital in the service of a chilling effect. Mm. What happened with GVK, right, what happened with the Mumbai era, we know exactly what happened, there, right? There's a lot of government pressure and the whole thing Adani got, right? Or I mean, seven, seven, you know, the three border state, right? Um, today, if you go to Kashmir, you basically can only get internet connection if you go, if you go to Geo, 
or geofiber. Like we know what this is. We know what state complicity here looks like, right? Um, that is a, I mean, when you don't believe that the state is a fair arbiter in business decisions, and when you believe that essentially state activities and state assets are being chipped away, and being given to private citizens. Uh, a term that is off, that is, was often used in Russia was that of asset stripping, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, have, we, are, we should genuinely be concerned that with the kind of economic downturn that we are seeing, that um, we may have a state that is starting to get engaged in that kind of behavior. So that is one of the pathologies that comes with uh, the kind of language of privatization. And I would sort of connect that to your final question about the yogiization of India, right? What has changed is not, I mean, Sai Baba, for instance, certainly had a large volume. But it does seem that if I am just simply to look from a distance, especially in North India, the scale of support and the scale and the breadth with, uh, that some of these uh, individuals cover, I mean, only a few of them are making the news, like a Ram Rahim. And, but if you travel around Haryana and Punjab, you know how big these guys are. You know how many of them there are, right? And um, I think that the intersection between this element of whatever you might say has always been in the village level and the infusion of capital to be able to draw bigger and bigger masses to your, to, to, uh, you know, under your following has created this sort of very, very complex environment where this is a model that can actually be scaled up for serious political effects, right? Um, and, you know, I think we just, you know, we, we don't know how to grapple with it. One sort of other political scientist told me that the closest analog we have is that of mega churches in the West, right? It's the closest thing that we can think of. But they still don't have the kind of political impact that we sort of associate with these, right? To do these things. Um, and I would just say, just as a, on a lighter note, what's interesting is I always find that we as academics are very slow on the take on these. Um, Netflix series seems to have picked up these, uh, you know, like your sacred game. Well, they, seem to, they seem to be seeing what's happening on the ground much faster than we are, right? Um, you know, and, and uh, maybe there is something about people who are just sitting and observing and trying to portray real life. Um, and their ability to see these changes and the intersections between traditional society and the Well, I mean, thank you. I mean, this just uh, the, the analogy in reference to the, the Soviet, uh, you know, transitions that you talked about took me to this. Uh, I'm just sharing this in the chat box uh, for the purpose of our students. Is this lecture by uh, Professor uh, Ian uh, Shapiro in, in, at Yale? who talks about this transition and he explains actually how Soviet communism and the transition towards Russian gangster capitalism, which is what you're trying to bring out from the sacred game. Uh, no, the, the, well, the irony of it, Dipanchu, his, history would have to remember Manmohan Singh as Gorbachev then. <laughs> <laughs> the man who liberalized India actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, this is a, I mean, thank you. Thank you guys. And we're a, a bit uh, over time, so I think we'll probably bring this to a close. I would like to thank you, uh, um, uh, Roshan. Thank you, Nilanjan, for taking the time. And I think uh, with your busy schedules, and right now I know there's always a lot going on, uh, whether it's at media houses or generally with the respect to the work that, that all of you uh, are doing. But this was truly enriching. Uh, we've recorded the session with your consent. We'll put uh, this is part of our uh, uh, recordings as uh, part of Samwad. So this will be available for students and, and scholars to be able to have a reference point about. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for the audience who are patiently waiting in um, and the, our IT support team, uh, Vidyut and uh, Karthik for, for today. Uh, and with that, we'll bring this to a close. Thank you guys. And I, I hope to see you at some point of time very soon in Delhi. I have resumed my field work in Delhi, so we, we can meet always meet when you guys get a chance to meet. Okay, all right, bye. All right, take care. Thank you. Bye.